Because of some prevailing social norms around gender and work, the work that is available to Indian women is often precarious and exploitative. The first example that we can consider here is that of home-based work. The ground reality is that for many women, um, particularly in societies where women's mobility is constrained outside the home, sort of upper caste India, Muslim world, uh, where women's mobility outside the home is looked down on. Um, Home-based work is a, perhaps the only real option for them. The other is that for women in many societies, um, it's a way to be able to juggle the domestic work and the care work with paid work. Um, because in many societies, by default, domestic chores and care work falls more heavily on women than men. So it's a way to combine that. So there are, women are either conditioned to be needing to be home-based workers, or it's really one of the few options for them. It's a very large uh, segment of workers. Um, it's larger than most people would think. And um, the conditions of work are hampered by really two broad sets of issues. One is in a country like India, if your home is your workplace, there are all kinds of constraints about the home as workplace, in addition to the work related constraints that you're being given work orders when there is peak production, but not when there's not that you're, oh, and delayed payments is another way that the global system squeezes home-based workers. Lots of them have delayed payments, many, 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 because they don't have a voice to complain, right? Or they have um, work orders, they've finished some goods and the company has moved on to another country because of, you know, cheaper labor costs somewhere else. And they're left stranded with, with work orders. So there's a, so many ways that they're, um, they're squeezed in the system. So it, there's a whole argument that it's bringing women the income that they need. They can do it in the quote unquote space of their home. And this is, and uh, they are easily able to supplement their income and so on and so forth, right? But much of the informal work uh, much of home-based work is informal work, right? It is very rare for home-based work not to be informal, very rare for home-based work to be to sort of, uh, you know, uh, have job contracts and any kinds of benefits and so on and so forth. So, uh, ha so you know, and typically this work is, of course, you have some of it is related to local production. Like say, if you're be making beeries, that is that is related to local production but as you rightly mentioned a lot of it has to do with global value change right so for instance work in textile work in garments embroidery work much of this work is linked to global value chain and this work is at the bottom of the global value chain and increasingly what you also see is that um, in the space of home, home-based work typically happens in urban slums, right? Work linked with global value chains in India typically happens in urban slums, urban slums in Delhi, urban slums in Bombay. Paradoxically, you have a lot of migrant workers who do this kind of work. So what you also have is really a race to the bottom in terms of whoever's able to provide the cheapest rate, work the longest hours, ends up getting that work. And because of the curtailed supply of this work, uh, you, you, you have, uh, because of the curtailed supply of this work, people are willing to work at any rates, right? So, and, and the danger also of this work is that you have a lot of child labor that might be uh, sucked into this work. Like, for instance, I'm not related to this, but we, we find like from rural Bihar, in, in rural North Bihar, Migration rates among kids in the age 10 to 15 have shot up and they are going to Delhi to do Zari work, right? And uh, they're obviously going to family members and so on and so forth. So uh, within the household setting, when work is organized within the household setting, it becomes a household activity. The danger of having children doing this work also increases, right? And then if women, if say young women start doing this at their homes at an earlier age, then the likelihood of them leaving school increases, the likelihood of them uh, 
sort of carrying on this work in treatises. So, um, all right. Well, informality is defined. Informal employment is defined as employment without social protection through work. So you don't have a health insurance contributions from an employer or pension contributions. And if um, there is sort of universal social protection, then the proxy would be if you get paid sick leave or paid annual leave through your work. So it's work without sort of standard worker benefits, if you will, that uh, actually globally about an equal share of women and men are informally employed. There's um, the notion has been always that women are more likely to be informally employed than men, but globally, this is not true. But in more than half of the countries, it is true. And most of those are developing countries. So in developing countries, women are somewhat more likely to be uh, informally employed. Now, women are far more likely to be home-based than men. But it's also true that many men are home-based workers. Uh, home-based workers are workers who produce goods or services from in or around their home or a structure that's adjacent to their home. And um, there are different types of home-based workers. So Convention 177 refers to one type, um, the home worker. And home workers are the, the home-based workers who are dependent on another a third party entity for, for work in some ways. In developing countries, it is mainly industrial outwork. But if you look in developed countries, homework also includes teleworkers and this new category that's emerged of uh, digital platform workers. There's some crowd workers who work from their home. But in developing countries, the home workers are primarily in the manufacturing industrial, very industrial out workers, not completely. And um, we also know that. Um, I can send you figures because we're just producing a global uh, statistical brief with the ILO on home-based work, but it shows both homework and and it's it's South Asia and Southeast Asia are sort of overrepresented. There's a lot of home-based work in those two regions, much more than in other regions of the world, and in part because of the industrial outwork. There's much more manufacturing home-based work in those regions. Uh, and so if you're an industrial outworker, home worker in developing countries in manufacturing, you're subcontracted and you're typically paid by the piece for what you, what you produce. And what we now know as sort of a stylized fact is that home workers are typically paid around half of what the factory workers in that same uh, sector would be so like you know the export garment sector the ready-made garment sector the home workers would be paid rough they would earn roughly half of what the factory workers and their <clears throat> problem is that they're dependent on the factories or firms up the chain for the work orders and the work orders come when there's peak production and the factories and firms want to outsource work uh, but it can dry up. Um, so in the factories, you have core workers and peripheral workers and the peripheral workers work, but the home workers are losing jobs and orders um, faster than the factory workers. Um, but there's some industries, if you take India, like the beauty industry or the um, uh, incense stick rolling industry, where those are no longer much in factories and it's mainly home-based work. So the work is um, reasonably steady, but the earnings are very low. And because they're invisible in the homes, <laughs> they haven't <clears throat> been, you know, sometimes the wages or the piece rates haven't been increased for decades, right? Because they don't have the bargaining power to, um, to demand it. Um, uh, we found out through COVID, the COVID uh, study that um, in Tirupur, which is the t-shirt capital of India, um, in Tamil Nadu more broadly, uh, the home workers are not registered in the state uh, labor welfare boards 
to get certain benefits. And this is something that the union of home workers in Tirupur is fighting for because they often don't get recognized as workers. So they're, they're layers of problems, right? So they didn't qualify in Tirupur for certain things that uh, other informal workers qualified for as COVID relief. You're watching the third video from this module. We just heard from our experts about the precarious and exploitative nature of home-based work. In addition to local arrangements, global value chains seek out the cheap labor of women working from their homes through non-regular work arrangements. The second example we can consider is that of paid domestic work. In developing and in developed nations, women are paid low wages to work long hours to cook, clean, take care of homes and raise children. So the role of women in the global economy today is absolutely crucial. It means that without the contribution, the immense contribution of women all across the globe um, doing unpaid um, or very low paid uh, care work in the global south and in the global north, uh, what is keeping our capitalist system afloat? It means that if states would start to remunerate the tasks that are inherent to the reproduction of the workforce, namely raising children, taking care of homes, uh, cooking, cleaning, all this care work, this invisible care work that is currently done um, in the shadows, um, the economy would crumble because this work currently is considered to be an inherent natural aptitude of women. And uh, we see that it, also, it is also stratified by gender, by race, by ethnicity, by religion, by nationality, by immigration status. And so I'm going to explain you briefly how that works. We have an economy, a formal economy, where women on the labor market are supposed to um, work as full workers. And at the same time, the care work uh, that is inherent to families doesn't disappear. Because we live in deeply patriarchal societies, and I will say that globally, it means that there is no single country in the world that cannot, that can say that it is not patriarchal in its nature. So because we live in a country that is patriarchal in nature, it means that all of those tasks fall inherently, fall uh, predominantly on women. And in order for women on the formal labor markets to be able to take up their work and to um, to, to, to earn wages that are uh, enabling them to fulfill their livelihoods, their livelihoods, sorry, then we need to mobilize other women to take on the care work for them. Um, and mostly those women are from lower social class, from um, minority backgrounds, being racial, ethnicity, or religious backgrounds. And there is a flow of workers, of female workers, female care workers or domestic workers that are going from um, countries like, um, let's say, Ecuador, uh, Senegal, India, to uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and the Philippines, very important to Saudi Arabia, to Germany, um, Spain, the US, France, to take on those work, this work. And it's intersecting as well with um, a system of migration and asylum that is a very um, exclusive and, and doesn't allow um, women traveling or women migrating from such regions to take up um, decent work that is well paid with a higher status in society. So I'm not saying that care work as such is work that is indecent. This work is the, it's the core of our world, basically. Without this work, we as humanity would not survive. Caring for children, having children, cooking, cleaning is something that is absolutely uh, essential to our survival. Nevertheless, because of the hierarchy of tasks in the international division of labor, this type of work has been devalued, has been um, invisibilized and has been marginalized. And so that's why the contribution of women is one that needs to be made visible, that their contribution needs to be rewarded as it should um, in order to um, be able to provide um, decent, work, decent wages and decent working conditions. The consequences of the invisibilization for people who are doing care work, so um, predominantly women um, and also minority women, it has to be said. It means that middle class white women from Germany, France and Belgium are not doing care work. 
um, but migrant women from you know working class backgrounds in uh, Belgium, France, and London, and also um, uh, other countries like, as I mentioned before, let's say Tanzania or Cambodia or the Philippines are. And so the consequences of this invisibilization of work is that the uh, protection framework, the legal protection framework that ensures that wages are paid, that the working conditions are respected, um, do not exist. Or if they exist, they are not reachable, they are not accessible for women working in, visi in invisibilized work, um, um, work environments. So that's why making care work visible is a political project that can ensure that the workers are respected, but also that we rethink the way our global economy works, that we rethink the value uh, of work and also the value that is created through such work. It means that the GDP calculations would also need to be changed in order for this uh, work sector to be fully, to, be fully um, to enjoy full visibility and, and, and respect. We have, you know, we have a, the paradox, I mean, there is, there are several paradoxes uh, in as far as women and employment is concerned. Now, if you're looking at in the informal sector, you have more than 90% of the work, it, there are many ways to define it, and I don't want to get into the details, but largely more than 90% of our workforce is in the informal sector, right? So where is it that women work in the informal sector? Women largely work in household industry, whether they're doing peace state work in their own homes. So a lot of outsourced work comes and comes to them in their homes, right? Uh, women, so often this is sort of considered, uh, women don't even consider this at work. This is something they just do along with housework and so on and so forth. Then you have, uh, the, Domestic work is one of the fastest growing sectors of employment in our country, right? And domestic work, again, is, you know, is a space where women, incomes may be high, incomes can be quite high, but uh, what is really striking about domestic work is the precarious nature of this work. Most women have multiple employers, and uh, while having multiple employers, they're also dealing with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of work-related situations. So, I, um, I mean, as so that though there's been a long movement towards the legislation of domestic work as work, there's, there, there are, it, it still hasn't really happened, right? So in many ways then, uh, as far as workplace, uh, workplace laws and workplace safety is concerned, that is something that, uh, that, is something that domestic workers are, are severely lacking because there is no recognition that, that the work, that where the domestic worker is working is a workplace or that there is an employer, right? So, and I think what is also, what you also see in domestic work is clearly, so the shift of agriculture industry is something that is, is clearly seen, sorry, agriculture services. So India is not really, doesn't really have a manufacturing sector. Or the very, our manufacturing is, you know, between 10 to 15% of our GDP. And uh, if we don't have a broad-based manufacturing sector, our structural transformation has been largely from agriculture industry. So typically women in domestic work are coming, uh, also migrant workers coming from you know, a general set, a space of agrarian distress into urban employment, which is equally precarious, or perhaps even more precarious if you, uh, depending on how you define it. So that's one, another, another major sector. Then you have whatever little manufacturing, there is all kinds of urban manufacturing, which, which, which exists. And women generally tend to sort of, when they work in, in these factory spaces, again, so, the one of the main issues in, in, in these spaces is that, uh, and these are all at lower levels of income, your wage, gender wage gap is very high. So in India, if, uh, in, in India, the general issues of workplace safety, if you're looking at specifically a gender discrimination, you're going to have, you know, looking at the wage gap is one way of trying to understand gender uh, discrimination. So typically at lower levels of income or at lower levels of wages, the gap is much higher than at the higher levels of wages. And this is really, I mean, you know, one would really expect it to be the other way around because at the lowest level, your wages are very low. And to, to even, you know, to expect such a high wage gap at the lowest levels of wages is unusual. But so if you're talking about gender discrimination, 
simply in terms of wages in in the indian context it's far higher at it's far higher at women who are working in factories far higher for women who are working as domestic workers compared to men who are working as domestic workers women who are working as casual labor right in construction for instance the gender wage gap is very high and this is not explained by this is not explained by endowment because most people are illiterate you know at that level so it's it's largely discrimination and uh, so you um, so so i mean these are this is these are broadly work that they're doing in the informal sector construction is not considered informal sector but you know uh, but because of the nature of labor intermediation because it's it's handled by contractors the conditions of work in construction are far worse in most cases than in the informal sector such as domestic work and so on and so forth so very concretely for uh, women engaged in care work uh, the problem of invisibilization is that um, there is a sort of a blurry line between the private and the professional. It means that by coming into families where they do care work, you know, there is this illusion of, oh, you know, you're part of the family. So they will do um, much more than what is expected, uh, much more than what is agreed on in a, in a normal working contract. And will work long hours that have basically no end because care work is and endless it means that it goes on in the night i mean if children are crying at night then you have to wake up you need to wake up really early before the family to prepare the meals you need to in between meals go and uh, get the food at the supermarket and then cook the food and at the mean in the meantime also uh, clean the house do the laundry um help the kids with their homework or at least you know be there for them um and so that's why uh, the the invisibilization of care work allows uh, an endless exploitation, which many times is not recognized as exploitation. It means that in many circumstances where care workers have um, tried to bring up that um, problem with their employers and said, look, I feel exploited, I'm working too much, then there will be gaslighting going on and a reverse um, uh, reproach uh, of not being committed enough, not being dedicated enough, you know, saying, okay, we've been treating you like family and this is how you thank us. So some sort of power dynamics within families uh, involving care work that um, will create a, a situation of voicelessness as well for um, the people employed in this field. Um, working within families is not the only arrangement that we can find in care work. You can find it as well uh, you know, as, you know, working for companies, um, cleaning companies uh, who clean offices. And in that sense, uh, you know, because it's working with subcontractors, it's really difficult to go after um, uh, the employer for um, breaches of uh, labor rights. And when I was told, uh, talking about women earlier, I'm also looking at other fields of work where women are predominantly um, represented. It means the textile industry, um, also, so the care industry, the textile industry, there's also another industry which should not be undermined and which should not be invisibilized. And that's it. this is the sex industry, sex work industry is um, an enormous field of work in our world. And because it is criminalized in many, many countries, we tend to not look at the labor rights of the uh, sex workers involved in this field. Also because they are located in a gray area on the labor market where um, they mostly are employed with irregular contracts or with no contract at all. They are paid under the table. So uh, these are not work arrangements that allow for social security benefits and social security safety nets to be implemented. And that's a major issue because then they become dependent on their employers and on the goodwill of the employer on the, um, yeah, basically on the will of their employer to uh, benefit from um, vacation or other types of um, social security in case something happens. All this uh, social protection framework, let's call it this way, because the social protection framework really not only look at wages, but also um, insurance, um, uh, illness, or, you know, pregnancy as well, very important. And in that sense, um, it is important possible to enforce such a system if the economy is taking place um, in, a, in, a, in a gray, invisibilized, marginalized space. And so it's the same for the majority of the, tech, of the sectors uh, predominantly occupied by women, because again, of the patriarchal structures, which um, 
um, tend to not provide the same level of protection when it is sectors occupied by men or by women. So there are also sectors occupied by men, for example, the construction sector, where a rampant human rights violation take place and labor rights violations. So I'm not, um, I'm not uh, suggesting that men are protected by way of their gender, but um, uh, it is important to notice that whenever a sector is being um, or when the, the, the proportion of men in that sector increases, then the labor rights and the status and the pay um, proportionally increase. And uh, in that sense, I think it's, um, it's important to mention as well that um, care work, as long as it will be considered a natural task that women do because they are women, it will be very difficult to enforce labor, um, labor rights and an and actual uh, protecting framework. In this video, we learned about the role that both home-based work and paid care work play in the functioning of the global capitalist economy. In the absence of a formal relationship of employment or of a single identifiable employer, such work is often considered informal. Like other types of informal work, home-based work and domestic care work are characterized by low wages or peace rates in the case of home-based work little to no social security and increased susceptibility to exploitation. The invisibility of informal work also acts as a barrier for workers to actually enforce their rights. With that, we have come to the end of the first module of this course on decent work for women. In this module, we observed how patriarchal social norms push women towards paid work that is poorly remunerated, precarious, and exploitative. The global economic system benefits from their precarity. In the next module, we will learn about the role of labor law and international labor standards in improving the quality of work. Thank you for watching.